<laughs> All right, so we've heard a lot about uh, longer working lives, 60 year careers, the workplace as a social determinant of health, uh, the central importance of engagement and intergenerational relationships to longevity and to well being at any age. And our next speaker, who is beaming over my shoulder, is uh, embodies those insights and new realities in, in every way and then some. And I don't want to use my 60-year career or yours um, to run through Maria Shriver's full bio, but um, Maria is many things. She is a journalist, an author, an advocate, an entrepreneur, um, a very proud mother and grandmother, um, Emmys, Peabody's, New York Times bestsellers. Um, <laughs> Uh, she is, in addition to her work with NBC, the founder of the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, uh, which is doing remarkable work um, in, in, in research and advocacy, and a new brain wellness company, Mosh Life. She's a one-woman content machine, uh, is founder of Shriver Media, uh, with award-winning documentaries, films, podcasts, books, a best-selling newsletter, a, best, a popular newsletter. Um, Maria was born into a family uh, with public service in her DNA, and many of you also recall that she was a really incredible, uh, rendered incredible services First Lady of California for several years. And so, as you can tell from that abbreviated bio, uh, Maria Shriver knows a thing or two about reinvention. And so with that, Maria, good morning. Good morning. And um, <laughs> I want to ask you, as somebody who's lived in the public eye for so much of your life, what led you to focus now on radically reframing aging? What Talk about your arrival at this place. Uh, well, hi. Nice to see hi. you. Hi. Good to see you again. <laughs> Karen and I have known each other for many years, and I'm a big admirer of her work, so I was really thrilled to be uh, interviewing or conversing with you today and conversing on this subject of longevity, reinvention, um, and I think uh, how to reposition aging and longevity in the larger um, uh, zeitgeist, so to speak. So I just did a big uh, summit called Radically Reframing Aging, and I partnered with Sounds True uh, to do this week-long summit because I felt that aging needed to be reframed. Um, the Today Show at NBC, where I work, didn't really want to do this subject, so I went and found a partner who did because I had discovered through my Alzheimer's work, through my women's empowerment work, through my journalism, that there's a lot going on in this space that isn't front and center. Madison Avenue hasn't caught up. So you see all of the anti-aging products advertised on 18-year-olds. We still have conversations about retirement and what age should you retire and the images of people going off to a golf course. And yet everybody that I'm looking at is wanting to continue continue to work, they're reinventing themselves, they want to reframe aging, and they want society to catch up. So we did this radically reframing aging summit, and it was their most popular uh, summit that they'd ever done. Hundreds of thousands of people signed up because they want to learn how do you age well? How do you age in place? How do you age and reinvent yourself, as you said? How do you have a career that can last uh, the decades? How do you start a new career, be it in your 40s, your 50s, or your 60s? How can society catch up to who the baby boomers are and how the baby boomers, I think, are really pushing this conversation? Um, how do you age? What does your health have to do with it? And the answer to that is everything, right? And how do you make your finances last? When do you start uh, having to save? And so I, I think it's a really robust, fascinating conversation. We included your work in that, uh, looking at how cities might change. I did also for the governor, Governor Newsom, I spent two years mapping out, working on a task force for him to how better prepare California as an aging state, what needs to change, particularly in the space of Alzheimer's, uh, because two out of three 
cases of Alzheimer's are women. So I'm particularly interested in that space, but uh, we have millions of caregivers. We don't have enough caregivers. So I'm really interested in how cities can modernize so that people can stay living in place. What has to happen? What has to happen in geriatric medicine? What has to happen in social services? What has to happen for families to be able to care for loved ones who want to live in place? So I think, you know, reframing aging is a fascinating conversation and one that we really have to push front and center. It's political, it's professional, it's personal. And for me, it's also a spiritual conversation. And so much of the work you're, you're talking about aligns very much with what's happening here uh, at the Stanford Center on Longevity right. and, and a big part of the new map of life and much of the work going on here involves a, a new narrative. And uh, you know storytelling uh, like nobody else. What, what is the story of, um, of longer lives that, that involve many acts? Yeah, what, what's I think the new that story was... that, that you would like people to think about? Well, I would like, first of all, for us to kind of reframe what aging is. You know, most people, you know, think, oh, you know, many law firms ask people to retire at 60. They don't even conceive of people staying longer. Uh, journalists, you know, they ask you to kind of here they offer you a package at 57 to get out. Um, so many industries are stuck in an old model. You know, when you talk about I saw President Biden uh, kind of getting frustrated. I think it was yesterday, the day before, where he was saying, don't you know, I, I know how old I am. I know everybody. I, I think he peppered that with a um, yeah. uh, with a little adjective there. I was paraphrasing yeah. because I don't know the audience here. <laughs> but I think you, don't you want know, to stop the uh, assemblage. Look here, at so. you know, I just had dinner with Frank Gehry, ninety-five at the top of his game, designing buildings all over the world, pushing the boundaries. Warren Buffett reimagining investing, you know, changing the conversation. We have a lot of people in their seventies, their eighties, their nineties who are at the top of their games and people are stunned to hear that. And people who I speak to who are in their 50s and 60s, they want to continue to work. They want to try new things. They feel like, hey, you know, I just raised my kids. Maybe I've been taking care of my parents. It's now my time. I want to go out and do something different. And yet society doesn't look at me as a valuable player. Businesses look at me as being too expensive for healthcare. Businesses look at me as being somebody who can't keep up. So I think we need a sea change, a narrative change, a reframing change. Uh, and I think the boomers have kind of changed so many things throughout our existence. And I think we will reframe and are in the midst of reframing. What does it mean to age? What does it mean to age well? I think kind of when we think about our health span, that conversation has to start much earlier. And I've certainly found that when we talk about Alzheimer's, you know, we need to begin to get people focused on their brain health and how they're living in their 30s and their 40s. And this entire, particularly when it comes to women, midlife, the midlife of women, what is happening in women's lives and when they're perimenopausal and menopausal. And so many of the physical changes that particularly women go through are actually brain changes as well. Well, and we need to fund research into understanding a woman's health span, which is very different from uh, that of a man. So I think that we need to catch up when it comes to medical research. We need more doctors who are schooled in what aging looks like and how they can work with us. So often I go to my doctor and they're like, we don't have the research to tell you uh, what to do, what's good to do. Um, so I think, you know, we have to keep pushing. We have to push our doctors. We have to push uh, businesses. Um, and I think workplaces are much better off when there are people in their 60s and 70s and Absolutely. people in their 20s and 30s together working. And I saw my parents do that. And so I find myself doing it. I work with 20 year olds, 30 year olds. I'm definitely the oldest person in the office by, but I also, I, th I would say many people kind of struggle to keep up with me in my office in their twenties and thirties. So, uh, which was the I same touch to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, so how do you, how do you, it's different about your working life today that you, you have a number of different initiatives 
right. uh, at, at, you know, all bubbling at a time when a lot of people, you know, when the old script, right, the former life script would have one talking about something called retirement. And, and in your case, and I think in the case of, of, of many people who reach wisdom, right, reach peak wisdom mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, beyond 60, um, you, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious how you come differently to the work and, and what you learn in, in this intergenerational workplace of yours, what do you all learn from each other? What's different? Well, I learn a tremendous amount from working with people in their 20s and 30s. It's particularly, you know, I started a company with my son a year ago called Mosh, which is a protein bar for the brain. And so I'm learning about business, about cost of consumer acquisitions. There's a whole other jargon language in that space. But um, I'm working with doctors and researchers and scientists in the women's Alzheimer's space, um, in the, you know, Schreiber media space, working with directors and documentaries. My daughter, Christina, and I just released last week a film called Take Your Pills, which is about Xanax, which is a sequel to Take Your Pills about Adderall. There is no shortage of subjects that I'm interested in in exploring. Um, and I, I just feel that like I learn from different generations. I love sitting down to talk to people who are in their 70s and 80s about what they've learned, about the long term view. Um, I love uh, talking to people in their 20s about how they see the world. And I love being my age. Uh, I'm not trying to build a career anymore. I'm not trying to win an award. I'm not trying to get on a bestseller list. I don't believe that those things will make me happy, will make me feel loved, will make me um, be seen in my parents' eyes. I think that motivated me tremendously in my 20s and my 30s. Um, I've raised my kids, as anybody knows, and you know, that takes up so much of your life. Uh, I took care of both of my parents as they were aging. That takes up a tremendous uh, part of your life. And so I'm free. <laughs> you're free time. and yet and yet you're not out you know you're not out windsurfing you're you're uh but i'm free for the first time in my life i'm not looking at the three o'clock to go do car oh my gosh yeah I'm who's got soccer practice right i'm not meeting with doctors caring for my mother with her strokes and my dad with his alzheimer's all of that stuff that took up a lot of my life i'm now free for the very first time in my life to look at my life to look at my schedule and say what do i want to do where do i where is my interest where do i want to uh what am i curious about where do i want to make a difference and that really is in women's health in aging in longevity and i want to make that as a journalist i want to make it as a public service person when i do the task force for the governor because they're all connected you know politics very often follows the story that's on the ground uh, is my experience and the story on the ground is that people need help uh, when it comes to aging there i heard that kind of a little bit of the panel before about how do people age with their finances, right? One of the things that makes a huge difference in how you age is your health and whether you're financially secure, right? So that conversation about saving, about living below your means um, has to start really early uh, in order to think about, wow, I'm going to be here not for 50 years or 60 years. I'm going to live maybe to 100 who's going to take care of me? How am I going to financially support myself? What do I put in place in my 30s, my 40s, my 50s to be able to, God willing, um, be in my own home? What has to happen for me to do that? And I think, you know, we're also seeing a lot of kids move back home. We see intergenerational living uh, in a way that we haven't seen it. I think that's as a result of COVID and also a result of finances. It's expensive out there. Uh, young people, I know my kids, my son is like, I can't make my rent on what they're paying me. Uh, so kids are moving. I go, your room is here. You can move back home. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the, the, the multi-generational living because there was a remarkable study uh, in the second year of the pandemic that found of the families that doubled up or tripled up uh, for financial or, or logistical reasons, some stunning uh, number that's over almost three quarters, over 70% of those 
uh, families opted to remain in some form of multi-generational living. Uh, yes, people found that they back could, in it works. With me. It works. I, yeah, that was not you. You were not well, in that. My study. sons moved back in with me, and yeah. that's how Mosh came to life because my son Patrick was living with me, and he we started talking, and we he's like, let's make this happen, and so that's where we started, you know, working on that. And my son Christopher moved back in with me, but they also both thought that they were gonna, you know, get me sick, and they were like, you're vulnerable, you're in that population, so we better move out because we also want to party, and and then of course, you know, they go on with their lives, but. Uh, so, so is that a Schreiber family requirement that to to hang out with you, they have to launch a product or a company? Oh, that's that was a first. But uh, oh, okay. it's, uh, I I love working with my children. Actually, I do a lot of that. Um, my parents did a lot of that. Um, which, you know, my younger brother, Timothy, who still runs Special Olympics to this day, went to work with my mom, as did my brother. So I, I think also one of the things I've discovered is that people look to their parents, their grandparents for role modeling in how to age. And my parents both worked up until their 80s. Uh, late into their 80s until they both passed away. They were both, you know, uh, traveling around the world, giving speeches, trying to change the world. Neither one of them ever took a breath. Um, so they were very adamant and they had young friends. They had 20-year-old friends, 30-year-old friends, and they had a mission. Uh, they also had deep faith. So everything that I've learned about people who age well, um, they prioritize their family. They prioritize their faith. They walk a lot. Both of my parents walked with a vengeance. So I try to kind of think about how they lived their lives with mission, with purpose, uh, with faith and with family. And I'm just trying to, in a way, emulate what they did. So not everybody gets to grow up with Eunice and Sergeant Shriver as their role models or <laughs> with a bevy of, of uh, remarkably talented kids of their own at the table and um, you know with tremendous respect for for all that your parents did for this country from the Peace Corps uh, to Special Olympics uh, the war on poverty um, I'm wondering what would you say to though you know somebody who's got a, a a different family constellation or lives or 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 does their 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 work or builds their life with um a family by choice uh you know have how, how talk about the uh ways to find intergenerational connection and inspiration um when you when you're not related talk about some of what you've also done in your life in that area you just made me think about my mother was speaking at the women's conference when I was first lady. And she said, if you don't have a family, go out and find one. Just yeah. immerse yourself in someone else's family, borrow someone else's family. And I think, you know, she created Special Olympics as a family. Uh, I tried to do the same with the women's Alzheimer's movement or with Mosh or with Shriver Media. I try to build it uh, as a community. I invite people over to my Sunday dinner all the time. I encourage them to bring their friends. I encourage my children to bring their bosses, the people they're working with, anybody that they've met that they would like to bring to the table. I always tell them, bring anybody you want to this table, but let me know by two o'clock that how, what the numbers are. And I think that we've had robust conversations and I've met a tremendous amount of pe people from my kids, from walking in my neighborhood, from my service work, from my Alzheimer's work, from my work as first lady. And I think I'm constantly trying to, broaden my concept of family. I'm trying to make sure that there's a place at my table for anybody who doesn't have a family, who doesn't have a place to go, be it on a Thanksgiving holiday or a Sunday night. And I often find people come and they're like, wow, I haven't experienced this kind of family dynamic at the table. And um, I also have my parents to thank for that. They, they, they ran a really robust table and you better come prepared to that table. I don't run as uh, you better come prepared, but uh, my mother- No, you don't talk trade about, policy at the table. Yeah, she, she did that. She would leave notes as I walked up the stairs. These are for you to read before 
dinner. So you come so before so and so is it before you meet ambassador so and so or yes the but, secretary yeah you no know, it's fast I I have a lot of people from religious life come over um because I kind of grew up with that. And I think, you know, melting people from different walks of life, putting somebody in Alzheimer's research next to a nun, next to a kid who's starting a startup, that by itself breeds interesting conversation. That by itself, uh, I like to put people in the room who wouldn't have met in the room. That's what I tried to do as first lady. That's what I tried to do with the women's conference. That's what I try to do when I, my Alzheimer's work is, you know, put a caregiver next to a researcher, next to a person with Alzheimer's, next to a spouse of someone who has Alzheimer's. So people can talk and share stories and learn about what, learn a new narrative coming back to reframing. Um, I find myself to be someone who believes in updating storylines on a continuous basis uh, because people don't hear the new story unless they meet people on the ground who are living that new story. So I, I'm, we're going to open it up to audience questions. I want to uh, give you all one, one visual, which is at the Women's Conference, which is a remarkable convening that, that Maria put together um, as First Lady of California. And I remember running behind Eunice Shriver, who was probably in her 80s at the time, and I could not keep up. So I just, yeah. just want to throw that out there. Um, I, let's see, do we have questions? Yes, please. Right, so we have a microphone. We have a, hang on, Maria. Please introduce Thank yourself. Thank you. Hi, Maria. My name is Susie Stadler. I'm an architect and also run a nonprofit called At Home with Growing Older. And I just love that you practice your freedom the way you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I want to bring up sort of the idea of a freedom house for people, a freedom home for people who grow older. Yeah. Uh, Ethel Anders, who was the founder of the ARP, actually way back then, introduced the model of a freedom house for people to grow old in, a house which gives them the freedom to stay where they love to be in their community. And there is such a huge need for this kind of yeah. age-friendly yeah. environment. And we, and we need proponents like, for instance, Frank Geary. If you can yeah. convince Frank Geary to become a spokesperson for that and actually uh, do a demonstration house, another freedom house, this would be amazing. Uh, Michael Graves, you know, did really good work around this. So I just want to say that the physical environment is often missing in this conversation. Yeah. And I would love to bring it, fill this gap and really make it part of the conversation. Well, I love that. And I will speak to Frank about that. And I'd like to find out more information about it because I think, you know, it's funny that you bring that up. It's, you know, I think about like I live in, I'm living in a house that I used to live in with four children, right? And um, everybody still comes over all the time. And But I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, you know, is there a golden girl scenario for me out there? Uh, do I want to go and live on a college campus? I've seen some of that, you know, where people of different ages on different floors. I think that's the next step, reframing, reimagining, uh, making sure that um, you're living in a place that's active, where there are, you can walk, where you can engage in conversation, where you can meet people. I love the idea. I love it being called the Freedom House. I didn't know that much about that. So I really appreciate hearing about that. And um, if I get your name and number, uh, we could circle back on that. We'll I agree that. with you. We'll get that to you. Tremendous amount. My brother, who runs Best Buddies, is looking at that for uh, young people with, men, you know, intellectual disabilities, kind of living on college campuses, living in homes, being able to live in community. And I think that, you know, I don't play golf, so um, not that I have anything against anybody who plays golf, because a lot of people, I'm, my son-in-law plays golf, my boys plays golf, but I, you know, I think to myself, what kind of community would be interesting to me to live in, a farm to table community, one that was sustainable, one that practiced a lot of the things that I'm talking about, that had exciting speakers that came in, that you know had a purpose, that had a mission. I think this kind of um, you know, outlook reframing um, is possible and is very much needed. 
for people of all economic stratas, by the way. I think we are just, we, we, could we do one very oh, quick? Yeah, I have time. Have, go yeah, you've got time, but I, I got a clock. Oh. So, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, I'm Donna Butts with Generations United. And a few years ago, I had the pleasure of writing a, uh, an article with your brother, Mark, about your father uh -huh. and about when he founded Foster Grandparents Program as a part of the war on poverty. Yeah. And so that was about 60 years ago. And you're so entrepreneurial. If you were to start a program like that today or revamp Foster Grandparents Program, which a lot of us have talked about needs, um, how would you do that or what would it look like to you? Well, how would you, if you say you're, you think it should be revamped, what would you suggest? Well, I think a part of it is it was designed as a part of the war on poverty. So it has very strict guidelines on how much an older adult can make in order to qualify for the program. So I think there's some innovation around um, around the, the um, not cutting people off just because perhaps they saved for retirement compared to other folks. So I think there's the income piece, but I also think there's an innovation piece that's based on how people want to age now, how they wanna be engaged, and that sort of movement from rocking babies to rocking the boat. So that's <laughs> what I wonder about when I think about some of the things that you talk about and that you do. Is well, I that. love that. I, I, maybe we should call it rock, grandparents rocking the boat. Um, but I think many of the grandparents that I know uh, are already deeply engaged in their grandchildren's lives and are there to enable their uh, sons, daughters, in-laws to go to work. They're, they're kind of unpaid childcare uh, in a huge way. Um, so I find a lot of the grandparents, I know grandparents, and this is something I'm actually trying to do a documentary on. So it's interesting to me that you bring this up, uh, the entire grandmother effect. Uh, there's a lot of science about the importance of the grandmother effect uh, on children. So I think there's a lot of research here, a lot of science here. Um, a lot of grandparents are raising kids single-handedly. A lot of grandparents, and I've done a couple stories on this for the Today Show, are, you know, as I said, indispensable unpaid child care uh, for grandchildren, but there are many who, you know, want to work and read and do all kinds of things. So I, I love the idea of revamping foster grandparents. I couldn't give you a idea right now about how I would restructure that program. I think I'd probably take the reins off of any program. I, I think, uh, you know, many of those programs that daddy started, which are, were so inventive, so creative, so imaginative, you know, legal services for the poor, all of these things um, that are still going strong probably need re to be reimagined in order to meet um, the next 100 years. And um, I wouldn't make them, I guess, kind of in one way, uh, I've found that poverty you know, is there's poverty of the soul, there's poverty of the spirit. I broaden that out. And I think poverty of the spirit is changed when you are in community, when you are in service, when you are uh, being needed, when you are being valued. Um, Father Boyle, uh, who I had dinner with the other night said, the only way people change, the only way people kind of come into themselves is when they are cherished when they are seen. And I, I love that word. And I think that so often people who are aging do not feel cherished, do not feel seen uh, by any of us and by society, do not feel valuable. Um, and we have to change that. We have to rock that uh, boat tremendously. We have to begin to um, stand in our power, stand in the power and honor. We need to invite people to the table who are older. Uh, we need to change the vocabulary around aging. And we need to hold up models of people who are doing it well, who have something to say and are continuing to rock the boat. On that note, Maria, I think uh, I think you've given us uh, also a master class in in boat rocking, and I, something <laughs> tells me there's going to be a Sunday supper organized very shortly uh, on on revamping um, foster grandparents. Well, and, I would and like other, to actually, I would, yeah, I would like to know what they have uh, thought of. I would like to um, hear, you know, maybe somebody could write me a note about. Yeah. 
what some of the ideas are for rocking the boat on foster grandparents. And I'm, I would love to get involved in that. And then we could rock them right over to Freedom House. Okay, we will, we will we'll put it on your to-do list um, yeah. <laughs> for the That's next- one of my uh, New Year's the... resolutions, Karen, is to take some things off of my to-do list. I just added to-, to, to Yeah, good, good luck, Maria. Um, <laughs> thank you very much to Maria Shriver. Thank you. And back to you, Ken.